Pond Boss, stocking your pond. Three, two. Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, Chico. Hello, good morning. How in the world are you today? Yeah, another beautiful day. Loving, I'm uh, loving it out here. It's good. Yeah, it's pretty cool hanging out at Lusk Landing mm -hmm. on the Brazos River. These are a lot of fun. It's a lot they, of fun. They really are. Yeah. You know, this I just good. I love hanging out, just talking fish and ponds and lakes and stuff. Today, I thought we'd talk about uh, the proper way to stock a pond. So, uh, a lot of info on this one. Yeah, and you know, way back in the day, mm -hmm. <laughs> there was just a way, a few ways to do it. As a matter of fact, when I, I first got into the to the fisheries business in 1980, January of 1980. Golly, it doesn't seem that long ago, but it was. Uh, the American Fishery Society, Texas chapter, had just published a book on how to properly stock a pond. And it was it was a kind of a dichotomous key. If this, then that, you know. So the algorithm kind yeah, of Yes, it was yeah. the way it was designed was is your pond larger than an acre or smaller than an acre? If it's smaller than an acre, you go this way. If it was in one acre or larger, you go this way. You know, and so it's way, way, way different than that now. You know, back then, as if your pond was less than an acre, you weren't going to stock largemouth bass because you couldn't grow that many fish. You couldn't hmm. really grow a harvestable crop back then because back at, with those management strategies back then, you'd stock like like 500 bluegills and three to five pounds of fathead minnows and maybe 100 red ear if you could get them. And back then, you couldn't buy all that stuff. And a little bit of they didn't know what they didn't know. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, and then in that half acre pond, it was basically stock catfish with some fathead minnows and maybe some hybrid sunfish because mm -hmm. those were kind of the a rage back then. You know, yeah. people like oh, that. Sure. But today's world is totally different. Totally different. You know, back then when a pond was built, the bulldozer would come, you know, dig a hole in the ground, push a bunch of dirt up to make a dam. Yeah. And... The way, here's the way it worked. You, you, you'd go to the small town coffee shop, look for the grizzled guy with the with the overalls and the khaki shirt. Greasy, greasy overalls. Tobacco yeah. stain on yeah. both sides of his mouth. But you had to be there by 5.30 because he was leaving at 5.30 in the morning to go get his equipment ready because he had a full day's work and he was going to work from the time the sun came up to the time the sun went down. You'd catch him while he's having coffee with his buddies and Say, hey, Tommy, can you build me a pond? And he'd say, sure. He'd reach in his pocket of his bib overalls, pull out a little spiral notebook about that big with an ink pen, write down your name and phone number. Where is it? Yeah. yeah. And then about two weeks later, he'd call you and say, yeah, I'll, I'll be there in 10 days. And then this big truck with a, with a yellow piece of heavy machinery with a shiny blade on the front, shiny silver blade, would roll off. And boy, four or five days later, you'd have a pond. Then mm -hmm. it would rain and... You know, afterthought was to put fish in them. Well, it's not like that now. Greetings, Bob Lusk here, editor of Pond Boss Magazine and longtime fisheries biologist. Welcome to the Pond Boss Podcast Series. Got some great topics lined up for you. Glad you're coming along. We are brought to you by Purina Mills, makers of Aquamax Fish Foods, Texas Hunter Products, makers of fantastic fish feeders and other hunting products, Easy Docs, and huntbirddog.com. We're glad you're here. Let's go have some fun together and get our learning curve up. You know, yeah. People build ponds for different purposes. I mean, even when Debbie and I had Lusk Lodge, comma, two, we had a swimming pond. We had an experimental pond. We had two hatchery ponds where we grew fish that I could sell to folks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you had koi in that other yeah, pond. Yeah, yeah. We call that the old pond, and that was kind of an experimental pond where we tested feeds yeah. for Purina Mills, and we had beautiful fish. We had a catfish pond, yeah. you know, and the swimming pond was the focal point. Well, today, if you're thinking about stocking a pond, the very first conversation we have is we talk about your goals. What's the mission? And then as we discuss those goals, that's going to kind of give us some guidelines as to <laughs> how we're going to stock, stock your pond. And, and then sometimes in these days of fast food where you pull up and say, you know, burp, burp, take your order, please. yeah, I'd like a number one with cheese and, and, you know, a Coke. Well, that mentality 
carries over into the pond stocking business. You know, you order it the window, you order it here on the box, then you pick it up at the window. So there's oftentimes I'll talk to guys that are in a hurry. You know, I, I don't want to wait. I don't right. want to wait. I want to get these fish stocked where we can go ahead and catch them pretty fast. So if you are getting ready to stock a pond, we start with your goals, your timelines, and maybe even a budget. Now, here's the traditional way to stock a pond. You stock a pond uh, with, you've got, the, you know, we, we've been through the drill of happy water in the best habitat. The next thing you're going to do is build the food chain. So if you're going to have largemouth bass, which, by the way, you can do that in a one-acre pond now. You just kind of got to know what you're doing. So we're going to kind of take you through a primer here about this and learn how to do that. So, Chico, let's talk. Let's, all right. Let's, all right, all right. You've, you've got a granddaughter. Yes, I do. Does she like to fish? She does. So let's say that uh, that you found 60 acres outside of Seguin where you live, and there's a little pond on it. What would your goals be? Well, it would be to have a fishing and recreational pond. It would be to, to have both. Of course, I'd want to uh, allow kayaking. It would be a kayak type of pond, a paddling. It would be mainly a paddling pond okay. that I could fish in, yes. All right. So when you were going to go fishing, how would you do it? Uh, from a dock, if I could. Um, okay. Maybe some kids off of a bank a little bit. But I'd want to make sure that I... probably I'd like to have some structure in places that I could identify and get out and put the kayak into. Okay, so you um, want some, some little hiding spots for fish. Maybe. So you so you like to have some congregation points for fish. Absolutely. And what would those fish be? Oh, it would be bluegill. <laughs> I'd be I be so you'd be dialed in on bluegill. I would be dialed in on bluegill. Okay. Yeah, it would be. Okay. Where we might go next door to your neighbor and ask him that question. He's mm -hmm. going to say, "You know what?" I've got a 16-year-old son that's on the high school fishing team, mm -hmm. and I want him to be able to learn how to catch some pretty good-sized bass. Well, you know, I, so, I doubt that he could learn that with a boat on a little pond, but that'd be a good start, though, because most be of those, start, almost right? every angler starts fishing on, in farm ponds mm -hmm. when they're kids. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's true. So, see, we just had two examples. Yeah, I'm, we're going. Of, not me. I'm going to, 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 I want to fly fish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, totally yeah. different goals. Yeah. You know, and 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 that's the way it is now. Yeah. You know, where where folks really just start thinking about what they want. So, how do you get there? How do you stock a pond? Well, there's several ways. Matter of fact, there's a lot of ways because now we've got fathead minnows. They serve a role, and the and all these fish I'm going to talk about serve a role. And the role the fathead minnows serve is to promote the first year, year and a half's growth of largemouth bass in a newly stocked pond. That's their role. Mm -hmm. You don't use them for any other purpose. Okay. Uh, bluegills, they're the backbone of the food chain. So we know the bluegills are going to be the fish that perpetuates the food chain over a long period of time because they reproduce often. Right. You know, red ear sunfish, they're going to be kind of an insurance policy. They'll add to the food chain, but they also feed in a different niche than bluegills do. You know, so here's stocking rates. If you want to do the traditional stocking rate, you stock fingerling bluegills about so big, inch, inch and a half, two inches long. And you start off 500 to the acre if you don't mind waiting a year to stock largemouth bass. Now, when I'm working with a landowner, we custom design a stocking plant. So if we've got guys, which this, here's what's more common than not. If that person can afford to build the pond, they can afford to stock it. Oh, sure. But, you know, I'm going to give you a little caveat here. I do have a number of occasions where somebody will build a pond and go over budget, which hap you, you may not, might as well think that's going to happen because it usually does. Mm -hmm. You're going to spend more building that pond than you think you are, but don't cut it short when you stock it. Because what a lot of guys are going to want to do is they're going to say, hey, I went over budget on this pond, so i got to cut some dollars on the fish. Don't do that. Because when you it's do that, it's real critical at that It's very beginning important pond. Yeah. in your process yeah. to do it right in the beginning. Okay. Because when you get three or four years down the road and then figure out just by looking at your fishery that you screwed it up, mm -hmm. it's hard to unpickle that pickle yeah. at that point. So don't, don't cut corners there. Just cut corners somewhere else. Don't buy a boat. Or, you know, wait a while to buy some of the, put the, do your other amenities, your dock or whatever, you know, but don't cut short on the fish. So with a stocking plan, uh, the traditional with, way is to start off with about three to five pounds of fathead minnows, 500 bluegill, wait a year, stock largemouth bass fingerlings. That's their traditional way. 
Now, more commonly now, people want a custom program. And for example, when somebody tells me that they want to grow some pretty good bass, mm -hmm. we'll start off with maybe up to 20 pounds of fathead minnows per acre, up to 2,000 bluegill per acre, you know, and 250 to 500 red ear sunfish per acre, give them six or eight months, and then stock bass. Because then, yeah, that you got to wait on yeah. that. Because yeah, what you basically property. do when you, when you increase your stocking numbers, then you're decreasing the time that you it takes to be able to, to add the bass. So basically what you're doing is when you stock the lower numbers, you're allowing them to grow up and reproduce and expand on their own, or you can write a check for that mm -hmm. and get that going earlier. And that way you can expedite the process. But in today's world, you can also stock, uh, you know, back in the day, it was, it was fat ed minnows, bluegill, maybe red ear sunfish, channel catfish, largemouth bass. That was it. You know, in, in some places, maybe golden shiners if that was appropriate. Mm -hmm. You know, and so today's world is totally different because now we can stock hybrid striped bass. You know, we can stock, uh, um, we can stock um, hybrid sunfish. We can stock channel cat, blue cat. We can stock crappie in the right circumstances. Don't stock crappie in small water. Just don't do that. They don't work very well. What's the minimum body for crappie? Crop, crappie, I, when you ask 10 different biologists, mm -hmm. you're going to get 10 opinions. Mine is, is you really need about 20 acres or more wow. for crappie to thrive. Okay. Because they've got to find their own niche. Here's the problem with crappie. Crappie spawn first every year in warm water ponds. They're the first fish mm -hmm. to spawn. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they have small mouths, but they're predators. So when they're the first ones to spawn, then they'd start to feed on newly hatched fry coming off the beds, yeah. you know, six weeks later, five, four weeks later, whatever the circumstances for that pond. So, and, and then crappie uh, will overeat the, the lower part of the food chain, which takes away from the bait fish and forage fish production for your bigger bass and, and up on up the food chain. And then they're inconsistent spawners. You can't predict if they're going to spawn every year hmm. because they only got like a five or six degree window where they will spawn. So I, I, I've seen several years where they'd come up shallow the first week of March mm -hmm. and stage to spawn. And then on Thursday, a cold front blows through, drops the water temperature seven or eight degrees. Then they migrate back out. Then the next week, the temperature comes up, they move back in. Then the front blows through. I saw uh, there's a couple of years not long ago where that happened back to back, where we had five weeks in a row of uh, of these cold fronts that would chill the water just enough to drive them away, right. and they didn't spawn that year because oh, they wow. just absorbed their eggs and just say to heck with it, things didn't again work. Again and again. Yep. So they're unpredictable. Okay. They're very cyclical, and they have a tendency to overpopulate. And when that happens. Then they become a management nightmare. Mm -hmm. You know, now there's been some trends lately in the last seven or eight years where people stock crappie with hybrid striped bass, where the hybrid striped bass, are, their, their role is to help eat excess numbers of crappie. And maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. I don't know, the jury's still, it's still a little early to tell. And you know what, in a three or four or five acre pond, if somebody wants to try something, I'm fine with that because it's not that hard to fix. You know, a three acre pond, if it doesn't work after four or five years, then you can eradicate all the fish and start over if you want. Mm -hmm. You know, so what I, what I like for folks to think about is know that the size of your pond matters. It makes a difference okay. on, on what you can do and how you can stock it. The kind of habitat that you've got makes a difference. Um, you know, in, 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 in today's options, like in the Midwest, you can stock walleye. You can stock yellow perch. You can stock smallmouth bass. I mean, I've even had a friend stock smallmouth bass in a tiny pond in Phoenix, Arizona, and they did fine. But he it was, was recirculating. Yeah. yeah, he was recirculating his water. Uh -huh. So it wasn't the heat. It was more about circulating the water and making sure it was oxygenated well for smallmouth bass because they're cool water fish. Gotcha. You know, so in today's world, there's a lot of options that you've got. So my best recommendation is to find a fishery specialist or a fisheries manager that you trust locally and then get with them and tell them what your goals are. And then you work with them to figure out what your stocking rates are going to be and then go shop and find your fish. Mm -hmm. I think that's the smartest way to do it. And it's still, 
I still believe, you know, I took an economics course in junior college where I learned the term caveat emptor, which means mm -hmm. let the buyer beware. beware. Yeah. You know, if you go buy fish from a fish farm and let them tell you what you want to stock, they're going to be selling you what they have. That what they need to move. Yes, yeah. yes. I never forget, uh, uh, I got a call from a, a colleague that was a member of a fishing club near Dripping Springs, Texas, years and years and years ago. He called me and says, hey, Bob, we had the lake analyzed, and this guy's telling us to stock goldfish. So I said, well, holy cow, tell me about that. So they sent me the report, and the first paragraph says, after thoroughly analyzing your lake, Using angling equipment and polarized sunglasses, we believe that your bass are overcrowded <laughs> and you need to stock 50 or 60 pounds of goldfish per acre in this 20-acre lake. As an experiment for him? Well, I don't know why. he owned a goldfish farm. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> so that's I mean, what he had. Right. So my point here is, is when you get ready to stock your pond, it's incumbent on you to figure out what it is that you want to do seek the best advice, and then go shop for the fish. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I've seen is that you're real diligent about, even when people are insisting on, this is what I want, you're going to really kind of point out what they might need yes. in front of that. Yes. To uh, go, I want to help you with what you want, but right. you have to consider the consequences. My job, I right. see my job as coaching and counseling yeah. you as the landowner mm -hmm. to help you figure out what you need to do and then once you figure it out, then we're going to hold somebody accountable to see to it that it gets done. You used okay. an important word for me, trust. Trust is a big deal. It really is. Yeah. It really is. That's it, a big it deal. It really settles down to that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, uh, I got a call oh, earlier this week from a guy. Oh, I know, I know what it was. I'm, I'm sitting here kind of remembering. What, what it was was he's been working with a, with a pond management company. But yet he's calling me asking my opinion. Hmm. So I said, why are you doing that? He said, well, I just want to make sure the advice I'm getting is right. So I said, well, if you don't trust them, you need to tell them that. It kind of says that. You know, because yeah. that, that's what it says. Yeah. Why are you calling me right. if they're doing you a good job? You know, and, and, I've, and I've talked to this guy over the years a number of times. And, and he said, you know, I just really wanted to get your opinion because I trust you. So I said, well... I've given you my opinion. How does it match with the one you got? He said, it's the same. I said, then go trust them. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> That's I, and who I, you're working with. I think that runs true through every topic we discuss. Yes. It really does. You're a dirt guy. You're, it, it, you're thinking about your, your habitat and where this yeah. comes from and what they're doing when you're not there to watch. Exactly. It's important. So here's your take-home points. Okay. There's a lot of different ways to stock a pond. It's going to be based on your goals, the size of your pond, the timeline that you're expecting, where you live, you know, and fish it to some extent, fish availability. But you do your homework, figure out what it is you want to do, and figure out your stocking rates and the timeline, when you want to do it, and then find the right company, the right fish farm that can supply the fish you want at a fair price. So, hey, listen, we appreciate you hanging out with us. If you want more information, now we're just kind of scratching the surface here, you can go to pondboss.com and look for the Institute of Higher Pondology. If you really want a deeper dive into these topics we're talking about, you can find those at the Institute of Higher Pondology, which is at pondboss.teachable.com. Now, you're going to pay for that, but it's going to save you money, I promise, because the more you learn about these topics, the smarter decisions you can make and the more results you're going to get faster. So, hey, listen, thanks for hanging out with us. We will see you the next time. Wow, that was pretty fun, huh? I'm so glad that you joined us. Say, if you're looking for more information, I want you to head over to pondboss.com. We've got all kinds of cool information and been there forever. It's got some of the best articles, topics, got the Ask the Boss discussion forum. And be sure to check out the Institute of Higher Pondology online as well. And subscribe to Pond Boss Magazine. That's what fuels the economy of what we're doing to help us put these shows on. So until next time, we'll see you then. Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true.